Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Choosing the Right Sensors for Industrial Applications, brought to you by Design World Magazine. And today's uh, session there, before we officially get started, we'll just have a, a few housekeeping uh, items there we need to go through there. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available uh, on Design World's website afterwards. Uh, so to listen to it, you can go uh, to uh, the, the the line that's identified here, or you can attend it, get it uh, by via, uh, via email. We also will have a, a Q and A session at the end of the presentation, so uh, you can uh, go ahead and uh, you know submit your questions. We'll ask them after presenters are all finished, uh, and questions can be asked using the GoToWebinar interface on your screen. Uh, the hashtag for this webinar uh, is uh, pound sign DW Webinar. So today's uh, presentation there, again, on uh, right sensors for industrial applications, uh, we have uh, three uh, distinguished uh, speakers who will we'll be speaking today, uh, and that includes uh, Emmy Denton, who's an applications engineer for Texas Instruments, Tim Schotter, who's director of new product development for all sensors, and uh, Dan Bruski, who's the senior product manager for SICK Inc. I'm Randy Frank, a senior editor for Design World, and I'll be your moderator today. Our first presenter is Emmy Denton, who is an applications engineer for Texas Instruments. She has more than 30 years of uh, semiconductor applications experience, specifically in analog and mixed signal products, including amplifiers, filters, ADCs, DACs, and most recently focusing on temperature sensors. Uh, Again, I want to make sure we remind you the presenters will be available to answer questions after the presentation. But without any further ado, uh, I'll hand the mic over to Emmy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be presenting um, temperature sensors mainly, um, talking about different types of temperature sensors and um, where they go in the industrial environment. Temperature sensors can be found um, in many places. Um, we say temperature sensing is everywhere. Um, that's our tagline. Um, and they are everywhere. Um, they have three key functions, and they're pretty crucial in, in system. Calibration, monitoring and protection, and, and control. Um, in the industrial environment, you'll find them in, in many systems for, um, doing these three functions. Um, factory automation, um, medical downhole dr drilling instrumentation. And I'll, c I'll talk about a couple of these applications um, as we go along here. Here I have a comparison of different types of temperature sensors, um, not only integrated circuits, um, ATS, analog temperature sensors, um, but also thermistor thermocouples and RTDs. And I tried to highlight um, the differences between the, the, the different sensors is that is um, common. People want to know what, what their um, strengths are. Um, you can see RTDs are, are best for accuracy. Um, they're known out there. They've been around for a long time um, specifically um, to do um, pretty wide temperature range. Um, and then the widest temperature range is covered by thermocouples. You can see they're up to 2,300 degrees uh, centigrade, which is fairly hot. Um, ICs and uh, thermistors can't quite go quite as high. Um, IC sensors um, mainly compete with uh, thermistors and surface mount type of packages. Um, and um, you can see there the temperature ranges are pretty comparable. Um, thermistors do come in a variety of packages that can go up to plus 500 degrees C. Their claim to fame is, um, is sensitivity. Um, they tend to have the best sensitivity. Um, thermocouples and RTDs are, you know, in the microvolts, um, and um, they need a lot of signal conditioning around them, um, whereas um, thermistors and uh, analog temperature sensors or digital temperature sensors um, are the simplest to, to implement um, in a system. Thus, um, they have um, the lowest cost 
just because of that, you don't need any support circuitry around them. Um, here I have a list of different types of um, integrated circuit temperature sensors. There's quite a few of them. There's just the analog output where you just apply power and you get a voltage out. Digital where you have a digital interface. Um, that's where you might not have an A to D converter in your system. So you can get one of these devices and you're all set. It comes with a variety of different interfaces, anywhere from um, single wire to um, spy interface. Uh, remote digital sensors, that's where you can have multiple um, fairly low-cost sensors attached to a digital sensor. Um, they're usually uh, diodes or um, transistors, um, 3904 transistors, which are fairly cheap, um, usually less than a penny, and you can sprinkle those around in your system, connect them to this remote digital sensor and via I2C interface and you can have um, multiple zones in your system measured easily. Um, contactless IR, um, that's a new type of sensor that um, Texas Instruments has released um, about uh, two years ago or so. Um, that's where actually you can um, place this component on your PCB um, within a several centimeters of the surface you're trying to measure and it would um, surface um, measure that surface temperature without any contact. Um, switches and thermostats are kind of cool because they have an analog output. So if your system has a microcontroller with an ADC uh, already built in, you can use these guys. They have the analog output, most of them do. Um, also, you can have an alarm. So then if your microprocessor goes south, you can have the output of this device alarm your, shut down your system or do, do like a redundant type of protection. Um, fairly low cost, all built in. You don't have to put a comparator and reference or whatever around the device to make it work. And then our most compl most complicated devices out there that you'll find, they're still kind of considered temperature sensors because they have integrated temperature sensors in them. Um, they are um, fan control or hardware monitors where they monitor fans in the system. Um, so that the fans are really critical for thermal management. Um, also, um, they monitor voltages um, and do other um, current and other system monitoring functions. Um, downhole drilling is, is one of the cool applications, well, hot applications for temp sensors, <laughs> for integrated uh, IC temperature sensors. Um, they are um, they're used um, to monitor the actual PCB temperature and protect the other ICs on the on the PCB that are in the drill bit digging down in the earth many many miles in many directions um, and um, they're also um, used to determine the life of the drill bit um, as it heats up it, it, it's its life deteriorates. Um, and, and they're used for billing um, and to determine um, um, the tool degradation. Um, so digital sensors um, are used there. Um, and um, 200 degrees C is the temperature range. Um, their sweet spot of operation is, is around 160 degrees C or so. But um, they can get up to 200 degrees or more. Um, and um, they have a this digital sensor, the LM95170, has a digital interface, high resolution, alarm output. It has all the bells and whistles that one might need. Um, one thing about these is the reliability is critical. So these devices might also consider going for an automotive sensor. Um, they have a AECQ100 qualification, which means that these are more reliably built. You might not think of using an automotive sensor in an industrial environment, but that's one thing you could look at possibly. Also, um, packaging is really important. Um, this particular device is available in the ceramic package, and it's also available in die form, so you can roll your own package. So you can look for that as well if you're looking for high temperatures. Um, another place where um, analog sensors or um, 
lower temperature sensors might be used, which is not quite obvious. This is for thermocouples. Thermocouples measure the difference between two junction temperatures. Um, here I show, um, down here I show it actually, I don't know if you can see this, but it's the, the ju these junctions here are actually in an oil uh, uh, ice bath, so they're sitting at zero degrees C. So um, when the voltage is measured across these copper leads, um, you would actually get the, the temperature of the two dissimilar metals, metal junction at J1. Um, not everybody has a nice ice bath readily available, so what's really done is um, they actually will um, bring these um, leads back to a isothermal block and then connect the temperature sensor to that block, make sure there's good thermal conductivity, and then um, take a difference temperature measurement. This is an analog front end um, that um, TI and many others have available um, um, used in a temperature transmitter uh, type of application. Um, and you can see the thermal couple down here connected in. Um, Um, analog temperature sensors are, are good to be used wherever um, an ADC is available in a microcontroller. Um, they have a high accuracy linear across temperature range. You can see here the linear transfer function of the output voltage. Um, simpler to use um, and less board space out in your system. And low power dissipation as well. Here I show a comparison of an analog temperature sensor versus a thermistor. Um, here you can see the thermistors in its simplest um, configuration, no, no linearization, as well as the analog temperature sensor. There are some filter caps here for noise. If your system doesn't have a lot of noise, you might not need these capacitors, and that included, that's included for the analog temperature sensor. Um, many of our devices do not require bypass caps. Um, here I show the comparison of the nonlinear transfer function of the thermistor versus the analog temperature sensor. And then this shows the supply current of the analog temperature sensors. If you're in a battery or um, handheld type of uh, application, um, current is, is, is critical. The analog temperature sensor's uh, current is really low usually and you know less than 10 microamps assuredly in the 5 microamp range. Um, whereas the thermistor um, depends on the size of the thermistor, the temperature range, how you have it biased. It's a really complex um, um, analysis that you have to go through. Also, um, self-heating can play um, into this, and you can have issues with self-heating. Um, so the lower the current, the better your accuracy is. Um, one thing about um, Temp sensors, um, we show limits of like 2.7 degrees C, something like that. Here we have one device where um, in the middle um, I show the actual performance of, um, of 96 units plotted. Um, so you can see that the performance of the devices themselves, the, the typical devices that, that are available, are much better than, than their limits. Um, you can get devices that are plus minus 0.7 degrees C up to 150 degrees C. You can sense temperatures up to 200 degrees C, and you can get matching in some cases of 0.1 degrees C um, without without calibration. Um, if you have, if you're interested in that, just give me a call or send me an email. I'll be happy to talk to you about that. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, well, thanks, Bobby. That's uh, some great information for our listeners in the temperature sensing area. Our second presenter is Tim Schotter, who is uh, the Director of New Product Development for All Sensors, and he's going to give us uh, some information in the pressure sensing area. Uh, Tim uh, has a background in electrical engineering with more than 35 years of system development experience and 25 years of MEMS emphasis. That's microelectromechanical system emphasis. Some of his accomplishments include developing the world's first digital tire pressure gauge and the world's highest sensitivity piezoelectric pressure sensor die. 
Tim holds several medical electronics related patent, patents. Uh, Tim, it's up to you and pressure now. Thank you, Randy. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank and welcome all of you for participating in today's webinar on behalf of all sensors. And uh, as you can see, our uh, topic for today is pressure sensors, resolution, and bandwidth. And uh, so to get started, let's say you have a pressure sensing application. And you can take a look at some typical uh, applications. For example, HVAC, uh, I have a little typo here. This is actually flow monitoring intended for HVAC applications or VAB, uh, variable air volume uh, controllers, uh, industrial controls where you have flow controllers and process monitors, medical arena where you can have some uh, uh, various equipment, anesthesia delivery systems, spirometry, respirators, Aviation, which is sometimes a subtle one, where you pick up airspeed and altitude indicators. Now, what happens is you, you have your own application, and these are just a few of the applications out there. And for, the, for today's topic, it's not as important that your application be represented here, but it is most important that you know you have your application and you're getting ready to start the uh, embarking on your, your journey into to figuring out what kind of pressure sensor to look at. So your first step really becomes, uh, let's take a look at some of the specs. So as you, as you start on this journey, you begin to find some fundamental specifications that are pretty much familiar to you. Uh, pressure range that you need, uh, sensitivity of the device, offset, linearity, temperature effects, accuracy. Some other parameters such as packaging may, uh, will of course, come into play. And these familiar specifications uh, can be represented by suppliers in, in many different ways. They can end up being uh, represented or embodied with one uh, complete total error band, which encompasses all of the error tolerances, or these error tolerances can be spread out into their constituent components of offset, span, temperature coefficient of offset, temperature coefficient of span, linearity, et cetera. And as you, as you uh, go through the, the various data sheets, you, you may also need, or you also find out that you uh, may need to get the definitions of a particular manufacturer's uh, specification. Uh, but you do that, and you're in pretty good shape, and you have a pretty good understanding of uh, what these specifications mean, how they relate to your application, and you uh, feel pretty good. Uh, then you see something about, oh, compensation te technology. Hmm, okay, what, what is this? Uh, we have uh, several uh, key technologies here at all sensors, and you'll find this in the industry. You have a, a basic sensor, which would be a basic sensing element that is uh, put inside of a package. It does not, it's a, a resistive, key is a resistive bridge. It does not have a, a base calibration. It does not have temperature compensation, but it is an available version of a device. And then you have another category, which would be a millivolt, uh, what we call a millivolt type sensor. And this millivolt type sensor has calibrated offset and span, and it has a resistive network around the bridge, which uh, provides both the initial uh, offset and span calibration as well as temperature compensation. There's the third type, which is an amplified or digital device, which is uh, again, that base resistive bridge, but it is uh, coupled with uh, an ASIC of either analog or digital nature, and that has, of course, your calibrated offset and span, uh, temperature compensation, and uh, is gained up for pretty much a direct interface to the microprocessor. So now you understand what these are about, and then you start looking at oh, which one is best for me, which one should I use? So. You do a little more research, and you figure out something uh, along the lines from the following. You have the uh, cost standpoint. You, you corner the sales guy into getting you some budgetary numbers, and you quickly figure out that, okay, the basic is the simplest, and the cost is the lowest. And as you proceed up the scale, you have uh, increasing cost numbers. And that's, that's a, a pretty good estimation. Say, okay, I'm good with that. Then you move into the temperature comp arena to determine uh, what kind of 
device you can use in your application as far as how the compensation and accuracy is concerned. You do your homework, you review the specifications, and you get a pretty good handle on the temp comp. And you find out that the basic sensor, well, it is not temperature compensated, so it does not get a, a big star for that, but it is the lowest cost, that's a trade-off. And the millivolt devices have a pretty good uh, offset span compensation. Uh, and the amplified or digital devices tend to be pretty much the best because they can operate over a wider range and take care of more of the variability that uh, is involved with the basic sensing element. So you have the best, uh, best temperature compensation performance with the analog or digital uh, devices that are integrated. So you, you finish up that column and say, okay, I'm doing good so far. And then you need to take a look at the ease of use, time to market factors, and how that uh, pertains to you. And you perform your uh, electronics analysis and start to look at your implementation. You look at the basic sensor and say, well, let's see, for a basic sensor, we may need to do our own compensation. That may involve, uh, certainly it's going to involve some gain stage in, in the circuitry. We may need to uh, introduce ovens and pressure controllers in our, our uh, uh, manufacturing environment. So that is going to be a, a piece of work. Uh, we are not going to give them a very uh, high rating. This, this is a guy with the thumbs up, just so you can't tell in the, the uh, image there. And you move on to the millivolt, and you say, well, gee, the millivolt uh, it has a, a, low, a low millivolt output. It's a pretty low-level signal. I, can, I need an instrumentation or dip amp to, to deal with that. And uh, it's got some pretty good temperature compensation, so maybe the only thing we do is uh, an ambient uh, fine uh, calibration of gain or, or offset, or maybe just an offset only on this type of device. So this is a relatively easy part to, to integrate, and it only takes... Uh, from a practical standpoint, a, a little bit of a gain stage for yourself. And then you look at the amplified and digital device, and you take a look and say, well, gee, my, my uh, digital output, I can just uh, directly pull into the micro P, I squared C or SPI, or, and, uh, or the amplified device goes straight to the A to D converter uh, because it's gained up and, and compensated and calibrated. So this device ends up looking pretty much like a, a plug and play when it comes down to ease of use. So now you're feeling pretty good because you nailed the trade-offs. But what your mom didn't tell you is there is a bandwidth resolution trade-off with a different compensation technique. And this is one of the most overlooked attributes when selecting a pressure sensor. Uh, what, we, what we have is on the horizontal axis the resolution and the vertical axis bandwidth. And uh, note uh, for this resolution, uh, this really applies to the effective noise floor of this system, whether it's quantization noise of a digital device or amplifier noise uh, at the front end of, of the uh, gain stages or some compensation artifacting which could be involved with uh, an ASIC that's actually performed, uh, that's being used for the, the performance of calibration. So what you wind up with is a basic sensor, which is that uh, pure resistive bridge has the highest potential of bandwidth resolution, closely followed by the millivolt device, which is, again, purely resistive. Uh, however, the compensation circuit is uh, tacked on uh, behind that, and you have a slightly lower signal level, so your signal to noise is reduced moderately. And then that gets followed by the amplified or digital devices that are uh, currently out on the market. Excuse me. So uh, this, my, my corollary to this resolution bandwidth is, is pretty much as fundamental uh, uh, an observation uh, to be made when looking at a, a pressure sensor in your system as it is when you go and look at an op amp and you need to uh, take a look and make sure that you have the, the appropriate gain bandwidth for your system. So that, that's kind of a, a corollary to uh, what we're talking about here. So, okay, so you have this, you see this data, and so, well, what does that really mean to my application? So before we go, let's, let's kind of review, and uh, I have, I have a, a graph, or not a graph, an indication that, that 
this arrow is showing better. The, the higher the potential resolution or bandwidth, the better the system is. And notice I use the word superior here. Well, superior, my, my father-in-law is a PhD from Princeton, and he uses the word superior when he is expressing the quality of, of some element or in, in the discussion, and I, I kind of I kind of borrow this from him. So it is as we increase the potential system bandwidth resolution, it becomes a more and more superior and a hard to come by system. Now to uh, kind of quantify this, we'll give you an example. Let's say if you're trying to read a license plate on a car doing 60 miles an hour from a vantage point of a satellite, you do need superior bandwidth and resolution. On the other hand, if you your requirement is to measure the distance traveled by a snail within a, a plus or minus one meter accuracy over one minute time period, you do not need superior bandwidth resolution. Of course, your application is going to fall someplace between these two examples. Uh, there's, there's simply, you know, that's kind of a widespread. So, anyway, now that we have this, this concept, which I'm sure you actually already knew, but I just wanted to bring this out to the forefront. Let's take a look at the applications and how they apply. So here's, I picked out three applications that are a rough approximation of where they might apply on this space of bandwidth resolution. Uh, medical respirators, for example, can have a requirement for a fairly high resolution, a very high resolution, and a simultaneously a high bandwidth. So we'll put them, you know, about here on this graph. Spirometry is uh, an application which will tend to have uh, medium resolution uh, with a medium bandwidth. And then an industrial uh, HVAC system will tend to have some fairly high resolution, but the response times of the bandwidth required here is relatively low. And uh, just a, a note, uh, for industrial flow controllers, which some of you maybe uh, may have out there, there is, they would, they can tend to fall into this uh, same category of high resolution and high bandwidth if they have a fairly high turn down ratio when you're trying to measure your flows. Okay, so this, this slide is okay to, to help you visualize, visualize a little bit, but I like to look at some Thing, uh, like this next slide a little bit better because with this we have the uh, ISO lines that show you how far away from the lowest to the, the highest uh, bandwidth resolution that you get. Okay, This is kind of like a, a superposition of the fundamental technology, uh, the compensation technology superimposed on the application. So now you have, okay, uh, as you are progressing outward, you're moving from the amplified digital to the uh, basic components for the, the maximum potential bandwidth resolution. Now, that's okay, but this still doesn't show you what applications can use with, can be used with which techniques. So, with this next slide, put in some potential compensation techniques. Uh, medical respirators, for example, tend to use basic and millivolt parts because they are on uh, the uh, highest demanding line for the bandwidth resolution that's required. They tend to uh, specifically use the millivolt parts. I uh, don't have that circle here, but they will tend to use that because with the millivolt parts, you do get the temperature compensation. The folks that are doing the spirometry tend to use either a millivolt or an amplified, uh, or actually, or digital parts. I have digital is missing from this this graph for, for some unknown reason. Uh, I neglected to put it in there, but this uh, applies just as well. It turns out that because uh, we, we have a new digital part out that has a slightly better uh, performance than our previous amplified devices, so we'll just throw that out there while we're here. Uh, so the spirometry tends to use millivolt and amplified because they're falling in this, this middle ground, whereas the HVAC can use any one of these uh, basic millivolt or amplified, but they are so cost conscious in the HVAC arena, they tend to use the basic parts, even though the basic part can be used for the highest demanding application. So 
now you have your framework and you had your table of trade-offs that you put together earlier, uh, but now we can add in the bandwidth resolution trade-off on the far right-hand side to help uh, throw that into the mix. And as we look at this, we can see that the basic is the best possible performance for bandwidth resolution, uh, closely followed by the millivolt parts, uh, which is just a slightly lower uh, signal. Both of these are, are fairly just considered the, the highest potential performance, provided you uh, use the low noise op amps with them or instrumentation amps as it, as it goes. And then it's followed by the amplified or digital devices. Now, these uh, basics and millivolts, if the application requires, would be the, the, the uh, device uh, compensation styles of choice. However, if your application does not require that uh, uh, significant a level of bandwidth resolution, you can then fall into the amplified digital devices, and that will get you a, uh, a potential uh, better time to market. It's certainly better from an ease of use standpoint, and it also provides uh, an ability for extended temperature range. So, uh, in conclusion, this, this bandwidth resolution uh, uh, element right here is something that is relatively overlooked, and we have to say good job on, on uh, doing your, your work from getting numbers from the sales guys and a uh, very good job on reviewing all the specs to come up with the, the temperature compensation profile that we see here. Uh, good job on circuit analysis to come up with this, and good job on listening today. I thank you very much for your time. On behalf of all sensors, I, I wish you a good day. Thanks, Tim. Uh, that was uh, some very interesting information in the pressure sensing uh, area. Uh, and our third presenter, uh, Dan Bruski, who's a senior product manager for SICK, Inc., he's going to give us some information in the positioning sensing area. Uh, Dan provides product management for both distance and fluid sensors in North America. Uh, and he holds a Bachelor of uh, Science degree in Physics and Mathematics from the University of Wisconsin, uh, River Falls, uh, and he has worked for SICK for 10 years. So, Dan, let's hear about pressure uh, positioning sensing. All right. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for being here either live or recorded later. And thank you for uh, Design World and, and everybody to put this on. So positioning, um, and it, it's gonna involve a lot of different trade-offs and a lot of different things um, that you just heard about uh, on, on, the, uh, on the pressure side and, and even with temperature, a lot of different choices. So we're gonna look at that, um, what those choices are, how to make those choices when you want to position something. And it's, it's very, uh, very broad, very vague. So we're gonna look at what some of those things are uh, that you need to take a look at. First off, positioning. So I guess here's my definition and where I'm coming from here is we want to know the location of something. So I got a couple pictures here of uh, like an ASRS, a stacker crane, retrieval crane, any kind of overhead crane, um, uh, trans, you know, logistics stuff. When you want to know where something is and you want to move that target with respect to that known location. So this could also be positioning um, really any uh, uh, part of a machine, a tool, a knife um, for cutting, for uh, in baking areas, as well as in logistics. So a lot of things where you just want to know you get something is in one position and you want to move it somewhere else and you need to know where it is. And in this case, everything's relative. So these objects are positioned with respect to something, something fixed. In these pictures here on the logistics side, typically a crane is, is, re, is moved with respect to a wall, something fixed that's not moving. Um, you could say it's moving with respect to the racking, um, but that can even move. Um, so we're looking at, at you're in point A with respect to something, you're moving to point B with respect to that same object. And that is very key for evaluating the specs that we're going to talk about of accuracy, repeatability, resolution, things like that. Um, so a couple of areas as we kind of can keep in mind here, um, and as the last presenter mentioned, um, you know, we're going to talk about a couple applications, but certainly, you know, broaden it out to what you or what you're bringing to this and the questions you have about positioning your applications and your products. So I'm, we're talking here if we look at manufacturing of you know knives for cutting, slitting, saws and wood and metal working, positioning a welding tip and drills and tools to the object. So in this case, the fixed location is, is the, the machine bed or the part and you're positioning something with respect to that. And in logistics, I already talked about some of the applications there, cranes, shuttles, 
um, things like that where you're positioning with respect to a, a wall, a pole, the racking. So what are some different sensors that can be used for positioning? So I, there's, there's probably more than four. Um, we're, these are some of the main ones that, that we're looking at. And kind of like you saw with, with the rest of the prior crew here, is what's, what's the trade-offs? Um, you know, there, there really isn't a perfect solution to cover all applications and everything. So um, just, like, just like we just saw, is you can take a look at what's the positives, what's the negatives, what your needs are, and find the ones that well, all of your needs are in green. So the green here are the good things about the solution. The red are the things you need to be concerned about. Maybe it's not a problem for you. So rotary and wire draw encoders. So these are, I, I think, the classic way of positioning something, of knowing where something is. You put an encoder on a wheel or a you know on a conveyor or on a part you see have a wheeled encoder a wire drawn encoder just adds a wire connected to the shaft of the encoder so you can move the wire around very high speed very high resolution low cost pretty much a lot, a lot of options and fit in a lot of places um, some of the downsides that you need to be concerned about is slippage and wear it's a mechanical solution um, especially when you have wheels on a rail or wheels on something with rubber wheels metal wheels any kind of slipping, any kind of wear, if the wheel wears down and the diameter gets smaller, then one revolution, you don't, you're not going as far as you used to go. And if you start and stop too fast and there's any kind of slipping, the encoder turns and it thinks you moved, but you didn't move, you just slipped. So what often has to happen is there needs to be another sensor, an inductive sensor, a proc sensor, something that, that is a homing device. So after a move or a run, you kind of have to recalibrate your system because of those mechanical errors. But again, has some very good good advantages to it as well. Now let's look at linear magnetic encoders. We're in the encoder realm here again, and we're just showing a picture here of one kind. And we have a rail. It's on the bottom, and here we have mag magnets in the rail. There's some different solutions similar to this as well. Um, and then a magnetic reed head over the top, and you mount them close to each other, and the reed head rides along the rail, and it picks up where the system where that head is along those magnets. Very high speed again, high resolution, very rugged and challenging environments. So that's that's an area where we're going to talk next here about lasers and some hybrid solutions where you have to have a line of sight. It has to be, you know, a, a, an optically clear area. Well, these linear magnetic encoders, they can be out in the snow and dust and dirt can be piled on them. As long as you can still move, you know, the magnets are still there. Um, so very, very good and challenging environments. But you can't really take corners with them either because it's a big long rail and a big head, uh, especially if we're talking long distances. There are some shorter linear encoders and smaller ones that can handle and, and negotiate some corners, but uh, it's, it's a matter of keeping a sensor in a certain relative position to the, the magnetic um, uh, encoder or a rail with slots in it. There's a couple different solutions on these magnetic, or uh, I'm sorry, on these linear encoders. So there's some strict mounting requirements, basically, because you have to have a, a head and, and reading either something on a rail, slots, or, or magnets. Lasers, um, I, I would say lasers and hybrid, I'm kind of looking at in terms of um, maybe even in time of, of, of solutions that were used for measurement. And we've kind of come along to starting to use lasers. Very simple setup, non-contact, long light. So compare that to the encoders. Uh, many choices of range, precision, and outputs. So the lasers typically aren't as fast, though. The resolution isn't as high as they're not as fast as the encoders, but there's no slipping. It's all non-contact. Um, so we're getting really now these latest in the last couple years, um, we're kind of at a third generation of laser measurement where it really is becoming almost as fast as an encoder, some real-time output. Um, we used to have combined sometimes encoders with lasers. So you would use an encoder to give you the high speed and the movements, but you'd use the laser to kind of recalibrate um, your system because of the slippage and, and the wear. Downside to lasers is line of sight only. Um, and if there's optically challenging environments, I mean, if you're going through a whole lot of fog and dust and dirt, you know, something gets blobbed or stuck on the laser emitter, the laser doesn't come out. You can't measure anymore. You can't position anymore. You got to clean it. Um, or you don't have those problems on the encoders. And then there's a hybrid solution. I wasn't really sure what to call this. It's kind of like an encoder, linear encoder. Um, 
we're looking here at uh, the, the picture here is a camera based system looking at a strip of barcode tape, a long strip of barcode tape. And you can go, um, you know, kilometers. You know, in this solution here is 10 kilometers of, of range that you can position. You can go around corners, you can go up and down hills, you can divert, um, you can have more than one object along a path where on a laser. Um, if you have two shuttles or two vehicles on a rail, um, one's going to block the laser of the other. Here you can have multiple heads, multiple reading uh, elements looking at either a barcode strip or there's some that use metal rails with slots in them. Um, it allows you to navigate nonlinear paths, um, obstructed paths, but the downside there is just from the mounting point of view is, is now you need to mount two things. You mount the sensor head and then mount the reference linear object, linear tape or, or rail. So something to you know, kind of look back on um, there, just like the rest of them uh, provided for the temperature and pressure stuff of, you know, what are your needs? Um, and, you know, try to find find the ones where the red things that are challenges aren't a challenge for you, you know, in your, in your application. And here are some selection criteria to use. Once you kind of get a technology like, okay, lasers is what I want to use, um, or linear encoders, now you got to choose within that technology family which one you want. So just like the last one, this comes down to choices and trade-offs. So range, that's one of the biggest things. Okay, you want to position something. Well, how far away is it? So it not only get read that distance, but what's the spans? So maybe your, your object is only moving three, four inches, but your sensor is mounted, you know, 12 feet away. So you need a sensor that doesn't move three or four inches or have that as a range. You need a sensor that has, you know, the, you know three, four, five, six feet of range um, to be able to get to the target, even though your span is, is smaller. So it, it, we, you know, a lot of people provide some sort of lookup tables here. So you, what's one of the first selections is where's your sensor? Where's your object to be positioned? That distance, get at least you have to have the sensor at least that distance or further. Now, how small of a movement are you trying to control? How small are you trying to position it? If you're trying to position a knife or a cutter or slitter, how important or how how precise do you need? Every millimeter, you want to know where to go, because you, you don't you don't want to have something a millimeter too thick or a millimeter too thin. Or are you looking at microns? Or are you saying, eh, position anywhere within an inch, I'm good. All right. So that's your resolution of how little movement you have before we get an output change. Repeatability is key here. It describes how close the desired location will be every time you move. So if you have a crane or a rail car or something you're trying to position and you move it and you get that output out of your sensor, you make, a, you can make, you make a little mark at that location. Move it, move it back until you get to that same output from the sensor. Make a little mark again. Keep going, keep making a little mark. Um, the, the picture here, and, I, and there's a little b bigger blow up picture on the next slide. Um, actually, two more slides. I'll, I'll, we'll get to that one. It's a little bit bigger, but the target there. Um, you've probably seen this before of the resolution it would be the size of the dots and the repeatability of your grouping. So every time you move to a certain spot, you get to that same location again. And you'll notice here I don't have accuracy. So that, I'll, I'll talk about that um, right before, I, before we're done here is resolution and repeatability are the key, not really accuracy. And that's kind of a, on the tips and tricks page next. Uh, we'll talk about why that sometimes is a little bit of a pitfall. Output rate, that's the next thing, is how fast is, is your system moving, how fast you need to position it. You need to be able to get the data out of the sensor to know where your target is faster than what your your system needs. You can have it match exactly what your system needs, but then you're, you don't have a lot of headroom. So um, if you're positioning a rail car or a shuttle or a knife or a slitter or a tool for drilling, um, and you're moving every millisecond, you need a sensor that updates more than every millisecond. And then the output type, what do you what do you want to communicate to? So this is great, the sensor will tell you where something is, now what? Um, do you want that as an analog output? Do you want that as a serial output? Hyperface, device net, Profibus, SSI, Ethernet, um, and that's really just a function of what your system is. Uh, how does it communicate today? Try to find a sensor that, that matches up to that. If there isn't one that fits all the criteria you need, range, resolution, repeatability, but oh, I need it to have this type of output, there's there's uh, gateways and converters um, that are available on the market to get you from one output type to another. So a couple tips and tricks, things to, to look out for or, or to 
to be concerned about, I guess, is when you're positioning things, especially if we take a look at an optical solution like a laser, laser distance measurement for positioning, um, there are some that have that you have to use a reflector, a reflective tape of some sort, like the picture there, and some that you can just use on any kind of natural target. Um, if you're positioning something, not just detecting or measuring, if you want to measure the height of a loaf of bread as it's baking, you're not going to have a reflector on the bread, so you need a proximity style, a non-reflective style sensor. But if you're positioning something to a fixed location, a wall, a rack, uh, a table, use something that uses a reflector. That's the safest way to go. So that way if the reflector is blocked, if something is in the way, you're not measuring and positioning off of some fake false location. Um, if that reflector is blocked, usually we, you know, sensors give an error and says, hey, don't move, don't position, you don't know where you are. So try to use a reflector if you can. You get really good signals and it's a safe, safer system. Response time versus output rate. Here's another uh, trap and, and problem people run into when they start looking just at data sheets to pick their sensor is response time. That's kind of the typical thing we talk about even in pressure sensors and temperature sensors we mentioned here is how fast does it respond? Well, here with especially laser distance measurement stuff, we have two different things. We have, once we've locked onto a target, how fast do we update? What's our update rate to update that output pin? You know, when we're indicating here's, here's where I'm located to your PLC, how often do I keep doing that? Then there's a response time, which is more like a switch um, where you move something laterally, break the beam of, of, the, uh, of the sensor. How long does that that object need to be in the beam before you get an output. So those are sometimes two different things, and the response times are usually longer than the output rate. So if you need something that, you know, you're, you're, you need to move within milliseconds, and you look at a response time of a sensor, and it says 10 milliseconds or even longer, you might say, ah, it won't work, it's not fast enough. Take a look at that output rate. Sometimes it might be called output rate, cycle time, things like that, um, and that might be, you know, half a millisecond with a 10 millisecond response time. So um, just look for that and then you can dig into it more later um, you know, as you get there. Accuracy trap, I mentioned that already. Don't get hung up on accuracy. Again, that's something that people look at right away on a spec sheet is, or they'll say, you know, how, how accurate is this? Uh, often accuracy isn't really what's needed. It's resolution and repeatability. It doesn't so much matter if the number coming out of the sensor matches what your ruler is or your tick measure. In fact, if you have outputs that are you know, analog outputs, there isn't really a good way to measure accuracy. I'm outputting 12.000 milliamps. You can't measure that with something with a ruler and tell me, no, it should be 11 milliamps. It's the resolution of how far do you move before I, that output changes, and will I get you back to exactly the same spot again each time? And what do I mean by exactly? That's, the, that's what you want. Accuracy really only comes into play when you have one sensor set up, it, you have to replace it. So you're getting one output from sensor A, you put in sensor B it might have a little different output, a little different offset, a little different accuracy, but the resolution and repeatability will stay the same. You might just have to reteach, relearn, or put in an offset and adjustment um, to deal with accuracy. Also, don't worry about using a sensor with way more range and bandwidth and headroom. Uh, if you only need to move three inches, but the right sensor that fits everything else you need goes 10 meters, fine. You, that means you it can get really dirty, it can be skewed, it can be uh, further away from its target and, and still work. You have a lot of extra headroom. And when you're going long range for positioning, alignment starts to become sometimes a challenge. So uh, try to use vendor supplied alignment brackets. There's some laser alignment guides, some bubble levels and things where if you're moving something over, let's say 300 meters, and you're trying to position a crane, you know, 300, 500 meters long, trying to get it aligned right so as it moves, you, you don't drift on and off your target. Um, can certainly be be a challenge. So that is it for me. There is, as um, uh, the Randy, when you go into the next one, there is one more slide later that, that has a little bigger picture here of the, the target um, and some talks about linearity. But you know what? I, I think I will end here and uh, so we can move on to the next stuff. And if I can, I'll come back to this if I need to, if the questions arise. But otherwise, you should be ready to roll. Well, great. Thanks, uh, Dan, for that uh, interesting update in the positioning sensor area. And, and thanks uh, to all of our presenters today. So now we're going to open up the remaining time for questions uh, uh, that you have submitted. And I uh, want to remind you that uh, if you haven't submitted a question yet, you can go to the uh, 
uh, to the go to, uh, go to webinar interface on your screen and submit a question to our presenters. But uh, we do have a, a, a couple in the queue right now, so let's get right to the questions that we do have. Uh, uh, this first one looks like it's going to be yours, Emmy. It's in the uh, temperature sensing type question. Why is low power so important when it comes to temperature sensors? Um, low power is important because of self-heating issues. Um, it, if a sensor um, draws a lot of power, it's going to heat up. Um, when you have airflow over the sensor, um, its junction temperature is going to going to change because its thermal resistance is changing. Um, and since the temp sensor itself measures its junction temperature, <laughs> you're going to add another error to your overall um, reading that you're trying to measure. Okay. Uh, here's a pressure uh, sensor question, uh, Tim, uh, for you. Uh, what's the potential noise floor that can be achieved with uh, today's technology uh, uh, and at, uh, you know, at what bandwidth? Well, Randy, what, what you have is uh, pretty much, if we go up that scale, the, the analog uh, ASICs, they tend to be in the uh, 10 to 12-bit range at a, a fairly high bandwidth, and high bandwidth being in the kHz or, or even above a kHz. The digital parts, uh, the new digital part is uh, about uh, 12 12 bits noise free at uh, close to the 1K uh, bandwidth. Then if you move into the, uh, the millivolt and basics, depending upon the uh, instrumentation amps, if you find uh, if you can manage to, to incorporate very low noise amps, and depending upon how you, you uh, apply the uh, pressure system, you can achieve something in the range of 14 to uh, uh, 17 bits noise free at something on the order of uh, 500 hertz to 1k hertz. Okay. I'm not uh, sure if this is uh, only for you, Tim, or not there, but uh, there's a question here. What, what kinds of standard uh, interface uh, is used for, uh, for digital sensors? Uh, so maybe, Tim, you could answer that, and if uh, anybody else has a, a, a perspective from their technology, we can add that. Yeah, I, I think that that will completely depend on the industry that uh, you're, you're going into. But for for the types of products that uh, we sell into, where they're they're board related or board related or integrated into uh, customers package, they tend to be I squared C or SPI interface. Uh, other interfaces apply when you're talking about sensors that are are remotely mounted and uh, there's some other data acquisition that, that's going on. That's typically uh, one of the keys of, of your area, Dan, there. Could you uh, answer, uh, you know, add something to the standard interface for digital sensors in the positioning area? Sure, yes, and uh, will this be a further uh, up or down the food chain um, from what he was just talking about? So on the board level stuff, we have those inside some of the distance measurement sensors. So that's the type of communication that's going on inside of our sensors um, on the board levels. So um, if you're building your own distance sensor, then, then you're on those levels. Then we take all that on the inside and then we give a in, industrial output. So that could be um, a bunch of different ethernet um, profiles that are out there right now, Profi bus, device net. Um, um, so those are kind of owned by certain people, Siemens and, and Alan Bradley. Um, depending on kind of which flavor you go to. Then there's some more open ones. There's the CAN systems. Um, then there's the RS family, RS-232, 45, um, 422. Um, and, then there, and then there gets some specialty ones, um, you know, Hyperface and some SSI, which is a serial synchronous output. Um, so those are those, this is kind of a different level um, of industrial outputs. And then if you're just you're looking for switches on off stuff, um, then that could be PNP or NPN. Um, transistor, low level transistor outputs as well. Some sensors have relay outputs on them as well for driving bigger loads. Great. Okay, from, a, from the temperature uh, standpoint uh, again, Emmy, uh, what is the thermal path uh, to a sensor and, and how does it sense temperature? Um, the thermal path to a sensor um, is mainly um, through its leads because that's the uh, wire or metal has a really good um, thermal conductivity. 
Um, so if you're if you're buying a um, a surface mount sensor, mounting it on a PCB, it's not going to measure ambient temperature. What what it would measure is your board temperature. So it would measure the air temperature inside the the case of, of the system you're trying to measure. Um, so keep that in mind when placing your sensors. It's critical. Um, usually package plays a, a big deal as to what what temperature you're actually sensing. Thanks. Okay, here's a pressure sensor one, uh, Tim. Uh, do you find any aliasing issues when dealing with bandwidth? I find any aliasing issues when dealing with bandwidth. Uh, that depends on the compensation technology uh, is where that answer really falls. There are some um, analog ASICs that take on a analog to digital and digital to analog path and if you do not provide appropriate anti-aliasing at the front end, you can absolutely uh, introduce aliasing and uh, uh, to your resultant signal, and that, uh, of course, is, is, is unwanted. If you're rolling your own uh, from a basic or millivolt sensor, then uh, it is up to you to provide the appropriate anti-aliasing filter, and as that applies with your A to D converters, so that you can uh, effectively uh, reduce or keep the aliasing below a level that is, is required for your application. Uh, for the digital devices themselves, it depends on, or, or digital uh, ASICs, it depends on the uh, source of the application as well because some applications will have a very low frequency component that you don't need to concern yourself as much with uh, anti-aliasing. On the other hand, some applications do, and in those cases, you do need to uh, prescribe the appropriate anti-aliasing uh, prior to the uh, gain stages and conversion. Great. Okay, here's, uh, we're, we're spreading the wealth around here. So, uh, Dan, here's one for you. Uh, can you talk a little about where ultrasonic uh, positioning and proximity sensors might fit in? Sure. Um, uh, ultrasonic and, and proximity. Uh, nice ultrasonic question. positioning uh, yep. slash pro proximity sensors there. Okay, yeah. Some of the proximity, I'll go backwards, is some of the proximity sensors, sometimes they're used um, to home or re-zero a system, um, especially when it's using encoders or rotary encoders that might involve or have some slip and, and wear to them, so they kind of rehome and move into position, and boom, you know, hit, hit that hit that uh, uh, proximity switch. A lot of us are accustomed to seeing something just on them, like at airports, the little uh, train, you know, tram that goes from one place to the next, it starts to build and slows down, slows down, and stops. Um, or amusement park rides, there's usually a proc sensor sitting sitting there, um, kind of zeroes that. If for position you're really only moving from point A to point B and you always know the distance and it's not changing, there's only two points, then you can kind of move and creep into position until a proc sensor gets, you know, triggers. Um, and that, that'll that work, but it doesn't give you a whole lot of uh, closed loop control there. You're kind of driving blind until you hit the proc sensor. Uh, ultrasonics, I don't see them used too often um, because the one of the lasers typically work a lot nicer. They're, they stay in one line. They don't spread out. You don't have crosstalk problems as much as you you could run into with ultrasonic sensors with the noise going everywhere. They're used often when when the objects are clear, um, when lasers become an issue um, looking through something. But there's no reason you can't use an ultrasonic sensor with an analog output or some serial output to position something as well. But then you do need to worry about um, the sound bouncing around and coming back and uh, and maybe getting some false readings um, and dealing with some filtering and such to try to mitigate those issues. Great. Here's one final question that I'm going to answer myself there. Basically, it's about uh, sensing technologies that we haven't presented today. And, uh, yeah, we didn't have a chance to go into all the kind of sensors that might be used in industrial applications. So we're just going to have to, you know, pass on any uh, any answers that uh, an expert could give if, if we had somebody from that area represented it. But uh, for uh, all the other people who uh, haven't had a chance to uh, get their question answered, or who haven't even submitted it yet, uh, again, you can see the, uh, the we have our 
the way to get a hold of uh, all of our presenters uh, shown on the screen right now. And whatever questions you have submitted there, since we've run out of time, uh, we will make a, a point there making sure that you, uh, uh, you get an answer to your question there. But once again, I want to thank all our sensor experts today for their presentations, uh, and thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, please tweet uh, any key takeaways using the uh, hashtag Design World Webinar. And uh, you have other information here on how you can connect with us through Design World there, uh, through Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or YouTube. Uh, and you can also discuss this on uh, engineeringexchange.com. Again, once again, thanks everyone for attending.